we are going to be discussing post-flop deep stack adjustments. Understand that as stacks get deeper and deeper, your strategy should change. And there are three main reasons for this. The first is that position becomes even more important because equity realization is going to shift to the in-position player more and more and more as stacks get deeper and deeper and deeper because essentially the player in position gets to decide when they want to play a big pot and when they do not. Also, the nut advantage is going to drive your strategy to an even higher degree than it does when you are playing a shallower stack because essentially, if you make the nuts, you're happy playing for a ton of money, right? And when you can play it for a ton of money, you can get your opponent all in with almost no equity and that's obviously fantastic. You're also going to find that the ability to make the nuts on different turns and rivers goes up in value, which is why, to be fair, you start playing mixed strategies far more at deeper stacks even before the flop so that you will have some super nuts on all runouts, which is very, very powerful. So you want to make sure that you play hands that can make the nuts. This is why you see big offsuit hands like King Jack offsuit go way down in value, 200 big blinds deep compared to 25, right? Also, your stack off threshold, which is the amount of equity you need to get all in, is substantially higher as stacks get deeper and deeper, which is, again, why you want to play more hands that can potentially make the nuts. And nearly all the strategic adjustments in this section will be derived from these three points. So let, first, let's discuss your stack off threshold increases. This is the point at which your hand is strong enough that you are happy to get all the money in right away. And if you consider, if you start with 200 big blinds and the flop comes pretty much anything, there's not a whole lot of hands you're happy getting the money in right away, except for the nuts and maybe the second or third nuts. Uh, consider, though, 20 big blinds deep. Let's say the button raises and you call with king, knight of hearts in the big blind. The flop comes, king, seven, two in the big blind. Continuation bet small, 25% pot. If you've gone through the tournament masterclass, you should know. Shallow stack, you just have to check raise pretty aggressively because winning the pot's very valuable immediately. And king, nine's one of the best hands you can have. And if you happen to be beat, you lose 20 big blinds, such as life. 200 big blinds deep, though, in the same scenario, facing a small continuation bet, you absolutely cannot put in a check raise here because if you check raise and get called or re-raise, you are going to be in a miserably bad scenario where you're going to be beat a large chunk of the time. But your opponent could also be sticking around with all sorts of draws, so you're in a pretty rough situation. Instead, as you get deeper and deeper and deeper, this hand becomes marginal and you are forced to just check and call it. Even consider a hand as good as like king-queen on king-7-2. It's pretty good. It's one of the best hands you can have, but if you check raise and get a lot of action in a spot where your opponent could easily have all the sets, maybe king seven suited, maybe king two suited, right? This is not a good spot for you. So you're going to find that you end up playing far more cautiously as you get deeper and deeper with your medium strength hands. Your stack off threshold changes a lot as well. And at deeper stack depths, there are a couple main adjustments that occur where more premium hands will be downgraded to marginal made hands on the later betting rounds. First, when you lack the nut advantage, you're going to continuation bet and check raise way less often. You have to be far more cautious when you just straight up lack the nut advantage, which I think logically makes sense. If you go back to the cash game masterclass, we discussed mainly how the range advantage impacts how often you should be betting. And if you did just have a big range advantage, often you would bet every time. But that's going to happen less and less as you get deeper and deeper and deeper. And the nut advantage becomes not going to say a totally overriding factor, but certainly a much more relevant factor when it comes to should you continuation bet to begin with. In spots where the board is likely to change heavily, even when you have the current nut advantage, you're going to want to control the size of the pot. Typically, this means continuation bet smaller and less often. And that's because if the board is going to change a decent amount of the time in a way that's not good for you and therefore good for your opponent, you don't really want to get the pot big immediately. You want to wait and see if it runs out nicely for you. Then you can make the pot big. Also, you're going to find that the cost of reopening the action on the river is higher as stacks get deeper and deeper and deeper for the end position player, especially when the out of position player can have a lot of nuts in their range and they know how to play and they're going to put you in a nasty spot by check raising you huge. So you're going to find that river play is often far more passive as you get deeper and deeper compared to shallower stacks. So we're going to go through some examples. There's going to be a lot of examples throughout this section. Let's take a look at this spot. Here we are. Button versus the big blind. 200, uh, we have 100 big blind strategy over here. 200 big blind strategy over here. Okay? So 
Button raises, big blind call, slot comes 10, 8, 6. The big blind checks, here is the button strategy. And what I really want you to focus on is the fact that you're checking far more often 200 big blinds deep compared to 100 big blinds deep. That's the main thing I want you to take away from here. I realize you're also betting way more polarized, therefore, because you're betting way less often. So you are using a bigger bet size on this board, even though there is already a straight available. Notice though you have some of the straights and sets and whatnot. So you do have a lot of nuts here. But what I really want to point out is that a lot of the medium strength hands are betting 100 big blinds deep, but checking 200 big blinds deep. As a clear example, let's take a look at a lot of the sixes, right? Notice queen six and jack six checking pretty much every time 200 big blinds deep, but 100 big blinds deep, they're betting half the time. And because we are betting wider, we inevitably get to have more bluffs. So take a look at bluffs like the queen X suited and king X suited, right? These are betting more often 100 big blinds deep compared to 200 big blinds deep, right? Also notice hands like uh, pocket aces are not betting as often because aces is likely good, but does not need protection or at least not as much protection as a hand like, let's say, pocket jacks. And if you do get check raised, you are not loving it. So in situations like this, you're going to find that you end up just betting far less often. And that is what's happening. Let's take a look at another spot. Here we have low jack versus big blind on 10, 6, 4. Okay. So again, well, this is actually a different scenario because 100 big blinds deep you are now happier betting with hands like top pair, good kicker, and over pairs, and probably playing a big pot on this super dynamic board, right? But 200 big blinds deep, if you do make a two-thirds pot size bet, you're not actually diminishing the size of the pot all that much. And if you consider the way the board's likely to run out on 10, 6, 4, it's going to be good for the big blind a lot of the time, right? Like if they put out any middle card, that's bad for the low jack, because notice we kind of lack the middle cards here, and the big blind's gonna have the middle cards. So this is a rather abnormal scenario if you're used to studying 100 big blind deep poker where you're gonna be betting more polarized because this is a very dynamic board. Now deeper stack room betting smaller because when the board does run out badly for us, it's actually really bad and it downgrades pretty much all of our strong hands to marginal hands. And for that reason, we don't have lots of good board covers to the nuts. Yeah, we have some suited flush draws and whatnot, but besides that, it's not great. So because we lack good board coverage on all sorts of runouts in this scenario, and the opponent should connect very well with the nuts on lots of runouts, that's going to result in us betting still decently often, but when we do bet, we're going to be betting using a small size. Let's take a look, a look at another spot. Here we have the low jack versus the button, okay? And in this scenario, the flop comes 10, 6, 4, the low jack checks, and then here is what uh, the button bets. So the low jack checks the flop, then the button bets 33% pot. Okay, what I wanted to show you here is that you are raising far less often 200 big blinds deep. Notice you're raising 17% of the time 100 big blinds deep, mostly with over pairs, top pair, good kicker, and draws of all sorts. And you're just getting it in with a lot of the, the high equity stuff, right? But 200 big blinds deep, you cannot do that, right? All of a sudden, you don't really want to be check raising much at all uh, when you're super deep because if you do check raise jacks or kings even, you certainly don't love it if your opponent sticks around because notice they're going to have all the sets and high equity draws, right? So this is a spot where, again, you may think you want to be check raising a lot on this board because you should be checking 10, 6, 4 a ton, by the way, as we see, like you know, all of your hands are checking some chunk of the time here. But you're going to be check raising way less as stacks get deeper and deeper. And instead, you just check call. Okay. Let's also discuss the cost of reopening the action on the river. In position on the river, when you check it back, you realize 100% of your equity every single time, which is quite valuable. When you bet the river, there is a cost where sometimes you will get check raised and bluffed and have to fold, which takes away your equity. And that is very, very bad. So as stacks get deeper, this cost is higher and higher because the out of position player can check raise huge and make you fold more and more often because you're getting worse odds. So for this reason, you want your hand to have more equity on the river as you get deeper and deeper stacked in order to profitably value bet. And as an, an exploitative adjustment, you're going to want to look for people who value bet too thinly and punish them when you're out of position. Check out of position a lot as you should. When they bet, blast them. 
Let's go through some examples. Here we have King, Queen of Hearts. We raise it up. Big blind calls, 250 big blinds deep. King, Jack, seven. Pretty good flop. They check, we'll continuation bet. If we get raised, we will not fold. Turns to five of diamonds, they check. This is a spot where I think betting is pretty mandatory on this very dynamic board, and we can bet big. We do go pot, good. If we get raised here, it's certainly not a good scenario. <laughs> uh, we do get called, fine. Rivers of eight of diamonds, opponent checks. This is a spot where if we were shallower stacked, we could be reasonably happy just betting in this situation. But this deep, if we bet and get raised, it's obviously horrible and the opponent can blast us hard. So 250 big blinds deep, this is a spot where you absolutely cannot value bet the river. Unless of course, you know your opponent's just a straightforward calling station. If they're a straightforward calling station, then sure, feel free to value bet. But against someone who is good, who's not gonna pay you off all that wide, who also will check raise bluff you sometimes, you just gotta check it back. Be done with the hand. It may feel nitty, but this is what you need to be doing when you are deeper stacked. And it's something a lot of people do not do. And as your opponents are more loose, aggressive, and battly, it's going to really, really cost you to open the action there. Let's take a look at another one. Here we have Jack 10. Hijack raises. We'll call the big blind. Flop top pair, bad kicker. Easy check call. This is a spot where in a tournament you may just want to check raise and play for all your money if you're playing 15 big blinds deep. But 200 big blinds deep, no. Check call. Turns a queen of spades, not great. Check, check. Rivers of two of hearts. We could potentially value bet small. We check though. An opponent now goes 55% pot or so. 60% pot, whatever it is. This is a spot where I think a lot of players opt to check call. And I think that'd be a mistake right here. When the opponent does not bet the turn, you should really start to remove a lot of flushes from their range, especially the ace and the king high flush. Why, why, you may ask? Because deep stack, they're going to want to play a big pot with their super nuts. So they're really going to want to keep betting those hands. They're not uh, rewarded so much for slow playing where they can get all the money in on the river anyway. So you're going to find that in this situation, your opponent's really not going to have a whole lot of aces and king high flushes. We block the jack high flush, which is nice. There are some 10 high flushes. The nine's on the board. So the best hand your opponent can reasonably have here is either a really low flush or straight. Notice we also block the straight. Notice we also block... Two pairs and sets with the jack. So while this may be an okay call against some people, I think a much better play is to use this as a big check raise because our blockers are really, 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 really good. Typically when you are check raising with blockers, you ideally don't want to be able to win all that often at the showdown. So I mean, like maybe this is not the 100% best candidate, but actually on this run out, it might actually be because we block straights, we block flushes, and we block two pairs and sets. So this is a good one to raise. Now you may ask, how much should I raise? Well, the answer is a lot. By check raising here, we are saying we have a very good flush or nothing. You can't be going for thin check raises out of position. It does not work. We need to be very polarized in the scenario. Either hand that's always good or a hand that always loses when we get called. So this is a spot to go huge. What is huge? In this spot, we go 800. What do you think? 800. The pot's only 225. Yeah. Go for it. Blast them. Put yourself in your opponent's shoes, by the way. You're playing a nice casual 5-10 game and all of a sudden your opponent's check raising you to $800 on the river in a spot where you, you don't have the nuts or anywhere near it. So what are you going to do? Most people are just going to fold here. Exploitatively, this might be a spot to really get after it because I think in general, a lot of people will even overfold this spot. I don't know if people are going to go around folding flushes or, or straights, but again, flushes and straights are hard to have for all the reasons we discussed. So what? I mean, if you have, they have a set, sets are probably going to bet the turn. Hard to have a set. They could have maybe two pair. Two pairs probably going to bet the turn. Notice they don't river too very often to make two pairs. So what? They have one pair a lot. You're, are you really going to call a gigantic check raise here with one pair against someone who is good and relatively balanced? Most people aren't. And well, that's going to be good for you because you're going to end up winning a lot of these pots. So against people who will value bet too thinly or just in general, this is a great spot to attack. So Make sure that you are always considering the cost of reopening the action as well. Now let's discuss pushing equity with deep stacks. I cannot tell you how often I hear students say something along the lines of, well, I didn't think my hand was worth three streets, so I checked the turn. And to be fair, this may get you by in a lot of scenarios, especially if your opponents are not going to punish you. But this is not a sound strategy. So let me introduce you to the bet bet, and then check line. You're going to utilize this strategy where you bet the flop and bet the turn and then check it back with a lot of stuff on the river 
in spots where you will do these three things. First, where you will clean up equity, meaning you're gonna make your opponent fold hands that have decent equity against your hand. Next, you wanna be doing this when you will not get raised too often, presumably because you have a lot of nuts in your range. Also, you wanna use this in spots where you will also take away your opponent's ability to realize equity by bluffing on rivers when it does go check, check, turn. Because if you check back the turn with a junky made hand and then your opponent blasts the river, you're gonna fold. But if you instead use that junky made hand on the turn as a bluff, and your opponent folds, that's fantastic. Or even if they call, whatever, they're not, you're still gonna realize your equity by getting there sometimes and being able to play a huge pot when you feel inclined. So let's go through some examples. Here we have a spot where 200 big blinds deep, button raises, big blind calls. Flop comes jack, seven, six. Okay, button continuation bets four big blinds, big blind calls. Turn is the five of diamonds and the big blind checks. All right. Let's take a look at what is betting and what is checking here. I really want to make a point that we are going to be betting stuff that can improve to the nuts. So what can improve to the nuts on Jack, seven, six, five? Well, flush draws, obviously, but also very importantly, hands with a nine and hands with an eight. So take a look at this. Jack nine and Jack eight are betting a ton, almost every time. However, notice King Jack and Queen Jack, better, better hands, are not betting. And that's because they are not going to improve to a straight ever, right? So the fact that we are able to improve to a straight is going to make us way more inclined to bluff. Also, or not bluff, but bet, right? Also notice hands like king eight and queen eight are betting, where stuff like uh, queen 10, for example, that does not have a straight draw is not betting. So you're going to find that a lot of our hands that are betting are going to have decent equity or ability to make the nuts on the river. So... What else is betting that may be abnormal? Well, take a look at these sixes. Normally, the six is not gonna be betting if you're shallower stack, it's just gonna let it go check, check. And I think most people do check it here. So take a look at this though. Hands with a six are betting almost every time. And that's because when you do make a six, it's almost always good. You can potentially get some better stuff to fold with a turn bet plus river bet if you do feel inclined. And that's good, right? Also consider the opponent's range. They're gonna have a lot of just random overcards and random gut shots and stuff. And by betting with the six, since they're not gonna raise us very often because we have sets, notice our sets are all in there betting, right? We also have nine, eight, which is in there betting. This is a spot where your opponent really just cannot get all that out of line against you. So what should the opponent do facing our bet? That is their strategy here. Notice when you do bet a six, let's just, Presumably we're betting our queen six. Notice what they are folding. Well, first off, they're folding a six, which is great. They're folding a seven, also great. They're folding out uh, high cards, right? Like ace 10, also fantastic. So by betting these hands, notice when we are betting, by the way, we're using a pretty chunky sizing for pot a lot of the time or 60% pot. We're not using small bets here. Also worth noting we are, or worth noting we are over betting sometimes. And it does look like some of the sixes are going for that. Sixes plus strong hands. Notice they are folding out a lot of hands with equity, which is very, 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 very important, okay? So you're going to find that hands like a six in the scenario really, really, really like to bet. If we do bet the turn for pot and the opponent calls and the river is a 10 of hearts and the opponent checks, notice we're again betting nicely. We are well protected because we have sets and straights in our range, right? So we can easily value bet over pairs and whatnot. Uh, but what I want to show you is that now these hands that... We're essentially pushing equity on the turn, like the six, king six, queen six, are now checking it back. Also, notice jack nine and jack eight are checking it back when you have it. So we are betting these hands, like jack nine, jack eight, and queen six and king six, on the turn with the idea that we're going to bet the flop with them, bet the turn with them, and then check it back on the river. Okay? Let's take a look at another spot. Here, low jack raises, big blind calls, flop comes king Seven, four, two spades. Low jack continuation bets two big blinds, big blind calls. Turn is a 10 of spades, low jack checks. I'm sorry, big blind checks. Take a look at what we're doing now. On this turn where there are three spades available, now we have to do a pretty good amount of checking. And what I want to point out here is that now, again, you want to be betting hands that can draw to the nuts. And notice, king jack is normally a pretty good hand here. And it's king nine and king eight. A lot of people bet hands like this with the idea that, okay, I'm going to bet it. But... These are obviously not flush draws because the king's on the board. 
and you cannot bet these hands that do not have the potential to improve to the nuts. You would so much rather bet a hand like ace-jack or ace-queen that has a spade, maybe even without a spade, that can improve to a very, very strong hand. So we see this happening again and again, where even though hands like king-jack have 60% equity, which is a lot, it's still not betting. And that's certainly worth noting. If we were shallower stacked, we could probably get away with betting these hands. But as you get deeper and deeper and deeper, you really want to be betting hands that have the ability to make a very, very strong hand on the river. And that's not King Jack on this board when the third spade comes. Let's take a look at two more examples. Not in the screen. Make sure we're in the screen. All right, here we have the Ace-King. We raise it up with Ace-King. Big blind calls. King-Queen-8. They check. We bet. They call. Turns to nine. They check. Here's a great example of a spot where if we had king, jack, or king, 10, we should definitely keep betting. But with ace-king, not so much because ace-king cannot improve to a straight. So check, check. River's a five. Opponent now bets tiny. This is a spot where if you've gone through the advanced tournament course on poker coaching, we've gone through spots like this where when your opponent bets small on the river, you need to raise aggressively because if they are betting small on the river with a logical range of some nuts, a lot of marginal made hands and some bluffs. When I say some, I mean almost no super nuts and almost no bluffs. Ace-King's almost always good against that very marginal range. So this is a spot where we definitely want to put in a chunky raise. We want to make all of their marginal hands indifferent. So we do. We blast them. When they call this time, that's good. Presumably we win. That's a spot where your opponent's going to realize their range is almost entirely marginal and you can put them in a nasty spot by putting in a raise. What a lot of people do wrong here, though, is they just call the river and think, all right, Fine. And then they move on. All right, 10-8 suited. We raise it up. Big blind calls. 10-9-5. Continuation bet for sure. They call. Turns the six of spades and they check. This is a situation where we're basically always going to be betting with a flush draw and a pair and a gut shot. This is an excellent, 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 excellent hand. We are happy to bet and put the money in. And when we do bet in this spot, we want to be betting using a large size. We're also going to be betting with draws and whatnot. And, you know, this could even be potentially a spot where if we did have a hand, like maybe a six, maybe a five, maybe a nine, I wouldn't be surprised if those hands are be betting using a big size some portion of the time as well for the reasons we explained in that situation earlier. So they check, we blast it, they call. And when you do bet this hand on the turn, I want to make it crystal clear, when you bet this hand on the turn, we're going to be checking back on most rivers unless we improve. Essentially, we are pushing a lot of equity right now immediately with the idea that unless we get there on the river to a really good hand, we're gonna be checking it back. And the nice thing about this is that the opponent does not know if we have a hand like this that's gonna check it back or a straight, right? And, or a set or over pair or whatever, right? So this is a very, very nice spot where we get to push a lot of equity on the turn. And this is something you do not get to do quite so much as you're shallower. Maybe this hand best because it's so incredibly strong, but similar stuff like pair with gut shot and whatnot would perhaps not be betting. Queen on the river, easy check, check, no reason to bluff. And, you know, we push some nice equity. So yeah, make sure when you are playing deep sack, you go for this bet, bet, check it back line with a lot of hands that can improve to the effective nuts that can also get value. That's going to be a very big difference compared to when you're shallower stacked and making sure you do this is going to add a lot of equity to your overall strategy. Let's further discuss the increased value of position. As stacks increase, position becomes even more and more valuable because as the end position player, you get to decide if you want to put in one additional bet. And when you're deep stacked, these bets can be gigantic, which makes position very, very valuable. So how does that change your post-flop strategies? Well, from out of position, say you raise the low jack seat and the button calls, there are almost no boards where you should bet every single time because of the threat of your opponent raising your flop bet, betting the turn, and then blasting the river. Almost no hands want to be getting it in against a reasonable range in most spots in that scenario. So you have to check a lot of the time. Also, you're going to find you want to size up your big bets from both in and out of position. On the turn and the river, you're going to be using over bets far more often when you are playing deeper stacked. Also on the flop, if you want to use a more complex strategy that will add EV to your overall strategy, you're going to want to add a third flop bet size. So instead of betting something like 33% pot and 66% pot, maybe now you bet 33, 66, and full pot. And you especially want to use this in position on boards where you have a large nut advantage, which makes sense, right? With your best hands, you just want to blast it and get money into the pot. Let's take a look at some examples where 
you raise the low jack and the button calls. So here we have low jack raising, button calls, flop comes ace, eight, three, two hearts. Here we have our strategy if we were 100 big blinds deep. And here we have our strategy if we are 200 big blinds deep. And notice in the scenario, when we're 200 big blinds deep, we check 91% of the time. Might as well be 100. Let me ask, why would we do that if we have a lot of effective nut hands in our range? Well, the problem is, is that consider the hands that are quite strong on ace, eight, three. We ace, king, ace, queen, etc. right? The problem is that these hands will often not be the nuts by the river because the opponent's various ace x will end up making two pairs sometimes and there's a flush draw staring right at us, which means that a flush is going to arrive some portion of the time and top pair, top kicker is no longer loving it. Whereas 100 big blinds deep, you're way happier just making bets where ace king is really, really good. So essentially, as you get deeper and deeper, you need to make sure you're protecting your checking range. And you do that by including some very strong hands. And in this scenario, because your opponent also has a lot of ace x in the range, you want to be checking with basically everything when you are 200 big blinds deep. Pretty cool spot, right? A lot of people see the ace on the flop and think they should be betting. But no, 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 no. Let's take a look at another one. Here, low jack raises, button calls. Flop comes king, seven, four, two spades. 100 big blinds deep, you're happy to just bet and put money in the pot. 200 big blinds deep, though, not quite so much. Now we are checking only 60% of the time, but still, that is a large amount of the time, right? Notice we don't have much of a range advantage because we are out of position against the initial, or out of, out of position against the button caller who should have a good range. And we're just going to be betting with a nice polarized range to some extent, mixing it up a decent amount. It's also worth noting that the king high boards in particular are way better at 100 big blinds uh, effective stacks than 200 because if you look at the 100 big blind range, it includes a few more low suited kings and some king jack offsuit, right? Whereas the 200 big blind range contains like jack nine suited and 10 eight suited and more six five suited and seven six suited, right? So these are just more hands that are not going to be great on this board in general, but mainly the king x is what I wanted to focus on. And I realize that this is obviously super sensitive. Maybe you raise the king jack every time in one spot and maybe every time in the other spot, and then that changes it. But this is another spot where we're out of position and we have to check more often, period. Let's take a look at another spot. Here we have low jack versus button on king 5-5. Five five. Now 100 big blinds deep, also doing a decent amount of betting using some big bet sizes. But from out of position, we are going to be doing a whole lot of checking, 37%. On this board, that's actually quite good for us because our pairs are all pretty good. Even ace highs, pretty good, right? And we have some fives. So a pretty great board with 53.65% equity, but we still just have to do a whole lot of checking. And when we do bet, we're using a small size. You're going to find that very, very frequently from out of position. When you are out of position as the preflop raiser, very deep stacked, especially if the board is anywhere near likely to change, like when there's a flush draw, you're going to be using smaller bets compared to when you are shallower stacked, like we discussed in the previous section. Now let's discuss what to do in three bet pots with deep stacks. Remember, as a stack to pot ratio increases, being the one who gets to put in the last bet is even more valuable because you can use huge sizes and you get to figure out if you want to put in that last bet. So similar concepts apply, but the leaks cost you even more in this scenario because the pot is starting bigger. Same as before, out of position should check far more often when you are playing with deep stacks compared to shallower stacks. So you may be accustomed to three betting pre-flop from out of position from the small blind or big blind, and then continuation betting the flop a pretty good amount of the time. How bad can it be? Well, it turns out not that bad when you're playing 100 big blinds deep, but 200 big blinds deep, it's quite often a blunder. It's also worth noting that in positions, equity realization is key when it comes to developing turn strategies. So when you will get jammed on, such as in a turn through bet pot at 100 big blinds deep, when you bet the flop and then bet the turn, you want to be bluffing with low equity hands because when you bet the turn and then have to fold to a shove, well, you're going to end up folding out some amount of equity. So you'd rather that amount of equity to be very, very low. So as you get shallower in three bet pots, your bluffs are going to be coming from low equity hands. But when you will not get jammed on, such as when you're 300 big blinds deep, your bluffs should instead have a lot of equity. So as you're going to get jammed on less often, you want your bluffs to have good equity because you don't want to be bet folding them, but you don't have to bet fold them because your opponent's not going to shove. But it's shallower stacks, they will be shoving on you, so you're going to want your bluffs to be essentially more polarized. Let's take a look at some scenarios. Here we have small blind three bets. 
versus the button. So the button raise preflop, small blind, three bets, button calls. Flop comes jack, nine, five. Take a look at this. We're betting 60% of the time on this board that's you know pretty good for the button. Notice we only have 52% equity in both scenarios. We're betting using a 60% pot bet most of the time. Well, 60% of the time, 100 big blinds deep. Again, just nice polarized range. But then with also a strong, uh, we're checking a whole lot more often when we are 200 big blinds deep. That's really what I'm trying to show you across the board. Out of position, you have to do a whole lot more checking when you get much, much deeper. That's because 200 big blinds deep, even a hand like aces, kings, and queens are not going to love it on a lot of turns. Whereas 100 big blinds deep, you can just make the pot huge to the point that you're not going to be folding your aces, kings, and queens. And essentially, if you can just get all the money in immediately, then positions are relevant, right? But when you are playing deeper and deeper and deeper, you're never going to be getting it in. So you're going to want to make sure that you do some checking with those types of hands. You got to protect the checking range. Let's suppose in this scenario, small blind checks and button bets 33% pot playing 200 big blinds deep. Okay, so this is a 200 big blind deep strategy. Notice that we're actually, we're raising some, but not perhaps as much as you may think. If we were 100 big blinds deep, we'd be raising more often in this scenario if we did happen to check. But here, notice what we're raising. Hands that are almost always good but vulnerable. And then some draws. What are draws on jack, nine, five? Well, it's going to be stuff like king, queen, and flush draws. And 10, eight. Six, five for a gut shot, plus a little bit of bottom pair here. So you see, we're really not check raising that much uh, beyond logical hands, hands that are almost always good but vulnerable, and draws. So that's what you want to be doing in this scenario. Let's take a look at this spot where they... Uh, small blind three bets and check calls the flop. Here is out of positions equity, the small blinds equity on all of the various terms. Notice small blinds actually in pretty good shape in terms of equity, 53.5% across the board. However, here's their expected value, how much they're actually going to realize. This is the amount of chips they own in the pot divided by the total pot. And you see that is 43.6%. So even with a pretty good range, from out of position, you are going to end up under-realizing your equity. If we could just call and check it down, we'd realize 53.5%. But because our opponent's going to get to blast us on the river and punish us, well, we only are going to realize 43.6%, which is a big decrease, which really does show you that position is quite valuable in this spot, even if our range is strong and pretty well protected. So let's suppose they bet a third pot on the flop on the button. We call. Turn comes to four diamonds, we check, and now they pot it. This is when they are going to start applying a lot of pressure, right? And this is going to show you why we're going to be drastically under-realizing our equity. Notice what should be folding on jack, nine, five, four, three diamonds. Nines are just getting out of the way. That's a bummer. Gut shots are getting out of the way. Also, we don't love that. Um, notice like pocket tens and pairs with no diamond have to fold. And these are all hands that have some equity against our opponent's range, right? And whenever you have these hands that have to fold to a bet in your range, it's just not a really great spot, which really does show you the power of being in position, especially if your opponent's going to be making errors left and right. Let's take a look at river play. In this scenario, we had the four of diamonds turn. I should probably write that here, huh? Four of diamonds. So we face that pot size bet on the turn. The opponent pots it. Now, on the river, again... Our equity is actually pretty good. As you can see, 56%. But we're only going to realize 48.9% of it. Still, massively under-realizing our equity because we are out of position and the opponent in position on the button gets to decide if they want to put more money in the pot. So let's take a look at the two of clubs. Say we check call a third pot on the flop, check call, pot on the turn. We check the river, the opponent shoves it all in. They jam it in our face. Take a look at what has to fold here on this jack, nine, five, four, two, three diamond board. We have over pairs and top pairs folding a large chunk of the time. That's not great, but it's what you have to do in these scenarios. And a lot of people, well, some people do, some people don't. But what it really goes to show you is that you're going to drastically underrealize your equity in these scenarios. By the way, here is the Buttons River strategy. On this run out, notice in this spot, they should be blasting it pretty hard. Remember, Jack 9542. In this scenario, they are jamming stuff like Ace Queen with a diamond. This hand's obviously gonna be crushing us in general because we're gonna be folding out a whole lot of better hands, right? 
Um, notice they have a lot of flushes in their range. This is really the problem for us. Is in the scenario they have a lot of flushes. They can even value bet stuff like two pair. They can jam sometimes with stuff like 10-8, no flush. That's a lot of fun. 8-7, no flush. 7-6, no flush, right? Getting after it. Really, really applying pressure and allowing the opponent to over-realize their equity. And uh, like I said, here's our calling range, same range here. Notice that they uh, we're really just calling off super duper good hands. And this is even with us protecting our range by having some flushes in it. A lot of people don't even have flushes in their range because they would have check raised the turn, which you should not do. We showed on the turn, by the way. You don't do much check raising at all on the turn because your opponent's blasting it. When your opponent's blasting it, you don't need to be raising. So we are even protecting our ranges with some flush or a range with some flushes, and we still have to fold a lot. And that's that's rough. But again, shows you the power of position. Let's take a look at one more. Here we have hijack raising button three bets. Hijack calls, flop comes, king, 10, six. Hijack checks, button bets third pot, hijack calls. Turn is a five of spades, so relatively draw heavy board. Take a look at the strategies in this spot, right? Notice in both situations, we are betting using a rather big size, but take a look at the equities. Why do we have less equity when we are playing 200 big blinds deep compared to 100 big blinds deep? Well, that's because out of position is going to be check raising thinner on the flop at shallower stack to pot ratios, which means 200 big blinds deep, when the opponent does check call, they're going to have a stronger, more protected range in general. So what are the differences in these turn betting ranges. That's what we really want to focus on because I know a lot of you have studied 100 big blind poker, but not 200 big blind so much. Well, take a look over here. We have hands like ace queen and queen jack and 10-9. Uh, All of these hands are betting a large chunk of the time 200 big blinds deep, whereas 100 big blinds deep, they're betting either never or not nearly mm -hmm. as often, right? This is because whenever we bet 100 big blinds deep, we're going to get shoved on sometimes. And we really don't want to bet a hand like ace-queen or queen-jack and get shoved on. Whereas 200 big blinds deep, we're going to get shoved on less often, right? So because we are deeper stacked, when we do choose to bet the turn, we're going to be betting with higher equity stuff in general, okay? So that's the main takeaway. Notice we're betting roughly the same percentage of the time, using roughly the same size, but with a different type of range. And... That's what we talked about at the top of this video, that as you get deeper and deeper and you are less likely to get shoved on in this scenario because we're deep stacked, this is a scenario where when you do bet, you're going to want to use more hands that have some equity. Whereas whenever you're betting with shallower stacks, you're going to be more inclined to use hands that have just junkier equity. Okay? Lots of fun stuff here. We'll continue moving forward discussing deep stack scenarios.